A strait is a natural, narrow body of water between two land masses that connects two bodies of water. The Mediterranean Sea, sometimes just called the Med, is where war at sea began, and yet it covers less than 1% of the total water surface on Earth. The Med has about 46,000 kilometers of total coastline and countless straits. In this video, we'll take a closer look at about 10 straits of interest in the Mediterranean Sea. Starting in the west, at the gates of the Atlantic Ocean lies the legendary Strait of Gibraltar. The Romans called this the Pillars of Hercules. Today, this passage separates Spain from Morocco, Europe from Africa, with a tiny bit of the UK thrown in to make things complicated. At its narrowest, the strait is about seven and a half nautical miles long, which means that any ship going through the strait must transit through the territorial waters of one of these nations. Here is a navigational map with the ocean depth listed in feet, and because it's such a busy and important international strait, there's a traffic separation scheme designated too. Ships can freely travel through the territorial waters of another nation, which extend up to 12 nautical miles from the coast of a country, according to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. One nautical mile is 1.15 miles. But the ships must follow the rules of transit passage, which basically means the ship can't use any weapons or fish or spy or pollute or conduct research as it travels. The vessels must also travel quickly and continuously through the territorial sea. Let's take a look at a map of the territorial seas around Gibraltar, up to 12 nautical miles off the coast. A nation or government, however, can also legally claim a smaller territorial sea, although that's quite rare, except when claims might otherwise overlap. Nevertheless, Gibraltar only claims about 2 or 3 miles of territorial sea. Let's zoom in on Ceuta, one of Spain's few holdings in Africa. Spain took it from Portugal in the 17th century, and today about 85,000 people live there. And now let's look at Gibraltar. There's not really much to it, a few settlements, a big port, small airport, and a big rock. The British captured Gibraltar from Spain in 1704 and kept it in a peace treaty nine years later. Today, it's a stubborn British holdout at a location of great strategic value. About 34,000 people live in Gibraltar today, and they're quite happy to be part of the United Kingdom. You can see here a map of Spain's exclusive economic zone, its EEZ, which extends 200 nautical miles from the end of its territorial sea. The EEZ does not include the territorial sea. In a country's exclusive economic zone, they have the sole right to explore and exploit the resources of the water and seabed, to do research, and establish artificial islands and other installations. However, fake islands do not usually grant real claims to more sea. Spain has one more settlement in mainland Africa, the enclave of Melilla. It's a bit smaller than Ceuta, but has slightly more people living there. Melilla has its own port and airport, of course. About 100,000 cargo ships cross the Strait of Gibraltar every year. 300 every day, one every five minutes. But let's move on from the Strait of Gibraltar to the French and Italian islands, Corsica and Sardinia, and the Strait of Bonifacio. It's supposed to be a tough strait to navigate through. You can see the nautical map here and some warning points. This international strait is about 11 or 12 kilometers wide, depending on where you measure it from. Let's take a look at a historic strait that does not count as an international strait, the Strait of Messina. In the Odyssey, the strait was flanked by the two monsters, Scylla and Charybdis. Today, over half a million Italians live close to the strait on either side. Unlike Gibraltar and Bonifacio, 
the Strait of Messina does not grant transit passage, because most large ships could just as easily sail around Sicily with similar convenience. The Messina Strait is not an international strait, but a national one. Here, transit passage is not allowed, but innocent passage is. The two are very similar concepts but innocent passage does not apply to aircraft and dictates that submarines must travel unsubmerged. And theoretically, the right of innocent passage cannot be suspended even in wartime. At its narrowest point, the Strait of Messina is about 3 kilometers wide. Zooming out again and looking at a different part of Italy, between the Ionian Sea and the Adriatic Sea, you can see the Strait of Otranto, named after the Italian town on Italy's heel. This was the crossing point for ancient Greek and Roman fleets, doable in a single day. At its narrowest, it's about 39 nautical miles, which means that you can pass through without entering the territorial sea of Italy or Albania. Between their territorial seas lies each nation's exclusive economic zone, which don't overlap each other. In the EEZ, transit passage applies. Not far from Otranto lies another important historical international strait, the Straits of Corfu. The island Corfu, or Kirkira as the Greeks call it, belongs to Greece today, but most of the land eastward belongs to Albania. Events on this island precipitated the ancient Peloponnesian War in 431 BC, but the Corfu Channel is also known for a series of incidents in 1946 in the early Cold War. The British Royal Navy tried navigating through the Straits, but Albania, then a communist country with no real navy, fired a few shells from the shore, believing that their waters were theirs alone. The UK demanded an apology, but nothing happened. About six months later, a few more British ships passed through, and two of them struck sea mines, probably set by Yugoslavia's navy at Albania's request. 44 British sailors were killed, and a few weeks later some British ships showed up again to sweep the area for mines and clean it up. The matter was taken to the International Court of Justice, and in 1949 they ruled that the channel was an international strait, that Albania had wronged in the first two incidents, and that the UK had wronged by unilaterally clearing the mines. Enough said about Corfu. Let's zoom out to give you a chance to situate yourself, and we'll take a look at another place in Greece. Here you can see the Gulf of Corinth and to its west, the Gulf of Patras. A gulf is like a gigantic bay. Between the two gulfs lies the Strait of Rion. This is almost a dead-end strait, a bit less than two miles across, and interesting because it has a large, four-lane, four-tower, cable-stayed bridge built across it. Moving away from Rion, let's take a look at a famous isthmus. An isthmus is like a terrestrial strait. An isthmus connects two larger pieces of land by a narrow piece of land. This is the Isthmus of Corinth. Now that I've zoomed in, you can see what makes this a little curious. A canal has been made almost six kilometers long across the isthmus. It's quite steep, and all ships must pay a fee to transit the canal. This does not qualify as a strait, because it is man-made, not natural. Nor does this canal, which is less than 25 meters wide, technically make the Peloponnesian Peninsula into an island, according to most observers. In ancient times, there were plans to dig such a canal, but it was never completed until 1893. However, 
The ancient Greeks did have a special road used to transport boats overland from the Gulf of Corinth to the Saronic Gulf on the other side. Not far away lie the famous Straits of Salamis, Salamis being the large island off the coast of Athens. It was in these straits in 480 BC that the Greek soldiers tricked and gloriously defeated the Persian navy of Xerxes, securing their independence for generations. The Battle of Salamis. Today, China is pouring tons of money in to build up the Piraeus, one of the largest ports in the Mediterranean Sea. North of Attica lies the island Euboea, or as the Greeks call it, Evia. Between this long island and mainland Greece lies the perilous Euripus Strait. In ancient times, it was just wide enough to sail or row one boat through at a time, but its geographical position means it is subject to exceptionally strong and quick tides. There are two bridges that connect the island to the mainland, but at its narrowest point, a simple two-lane bridge fewer than 50 meters long spans the Euripus Strait. You'll notice that the image here gets pixelated. We see there's the church there, that's nice. But what's going on? Google Earth sometimes obscures the satellite images of military installations, so we can be pretty sure there's a Greek naval base there or something. Anyway, moving away from Greece, we'll take a look at the Turkish Straits, which connect the Mediterranean with the Black Sea through the comparatively tiny Sea of Marmara in between. We will first examine the Dardanelles, which used to be called the Gallipoli Strait, and before that was called the Hellespont. After that we'll look at the Bosporus, also called the Istanbul Strait. The Gallipoli Peninsula is perhaps most famous for being the site of a major Ottoman victory in 1915 against the allied Australian and New Zealander troops. Another popular story, if you believe it, is that before he invaded Greece, the Persian king Xerxes built two gigantic pontoon bridges, each using more than 300 ships tied together so his army could march across the Hellespont. Today this would not be considered innocent passage. At its narrowest, at Chinakale, the strait is just under one mile wide. There is no bridge across the Dardanelles today. The last Mediterranean Strait we'll look at in this video is the Bosporus, which divides Istanbul and separates Europe from Asia. Unlike the earlier straits we've looked at, the two Turkish straits are not regulated by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, but by the earlier Montreux Convention of 1936. It was called the Montreux Convention because it was signed in Montreux, Switzerland. This agreement came at a time when Italy was getting aggressive all around the Med and the great powers of Europe were struggling to contain each other. Britain and France wanted to prevent the USSR from accessing the Med, whereas the USSR wanted access to the Med and to secure its own position in the Black Sea. Everyone wanted to prevent Turkey from allying with Italy or Germany and Turkey wanted as much authority over the Straits as it could possibly get. So an agreement was made wherein commercial ships could sail without restriction in times of peace. Tonnage limits were put on nations outside ones bordering the Black Sea, preventing many foreign warships from entering or lingering in the Black Sea. In recent years though, Turkey has been talking about perhaps building a canal capable of bypassing the Bosporus altogether. This proposed Istanbul Canal, less than 30 miles from the Bosporus, would find its outlet near the airport and include a new container terminal on the Black Sea, as well as several artificial islands. Its length, compared to the Bosporus, would be 9 miles longer and comparable in width. Turkey has said it would not be subject to the Montreux Convention. Today, the Bosporus is three times as busy as the Suez Canal. 
Over 100 million tons of oil move through the Turkish Straits every year, as well as over 100 cargo ships, including oil tankers, every day. In theory, the canal will generate money by allowing Turkey to charge access fees, which they are not allowed to do with the Bosporus. Other players, like Russia, believe the canal has more secretive geopolitical ambitions. Since the canal wouldn't be subject to the Montreux Convention, warships and aircraft carriers from non-Black Sea powers like the United States could theoretically move into the Black Sea and project power in the region. The Black Sea is like a lake inside the Mediterranean Sea, a sort of med in miniature but without the islands. It has its own history, its own power struggles, and its own changing norms. The sea is one, and the sea means commerce. Control of the waters has always been linked to the economy, and to national and international power. Let's take a look at one more strait. This one isn't in the Med, but it's close. I don't mean the Suez Canal, but maybe one day I should make a video about that. Just south of the Gulf of Suez, in between Egypt and Saudi Arabia, lie the Straits of Tehran. Separated by reefs and sand into two pathways, the Straits of Tehran are dead-end straits, which means innocent passage applies here. The Straits of Tehran sit at the mouth of the Gulf of Aqaba. This waterway matters for Israel and Jordan because it's their only border on the Red Sea. Israel has the city Eilat and Jordan Aqaba. Each of them have a port, giving them access to the Red Sea, to the Arabian Sea, and beyond. Especially for Israel, surrounded by historic enemies, the right of unimpeded passage through those straits is non-negotiable. Egypt and Israel have never been friends, and they are the only two countries to border the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. They understand the importance of the waterways that connect our globalized world. Did you like this video? Have you subscribed to the channel yet? If you got questions, comments, feedback, hate mail, or recipes, let me know in the comments below. A full list of sources and useful links can be found in the video description.